Um, this panel is devoted to um, minorities in the juvenile justice system, and we're going to be talking about two very different types of minorities. Um, one minority that is almost the majority um, in the juvenile justice system, that's children of color, um, and one minority that is a distinct minority in the juvenile justice system, but that is growing, and that um, is, uh, is uh, girls. Um, our first speaker is Shauna Epps. Shauna is an expert in disproportionate minority contact um, and has um, worked in numerous capacities in that area. She's currently the DMC specialist for the Center for Children's Law and Policy in Washington, D.C. She's also connected with um, a project that both Beth Kaufman and I are also connected with, which is the MacArthur Foundation's Models for Change um, initiative. Uh, one of the goals of that initiative is to reduce DMC, um, and Shauna is uh, acting in her capacity as specialist there in helping um, localities get the tools they need uh, to, to do that. Um, so I, I want to thank Shauna for joining us today, and I will turn the mic over to her. Um, good morning. I just want to um, establish a disclaimer at the very beginning. I come to you this morning, I got in at 4 a.m. from Rapids Parish, Louisiana, where Models for Change is working. Um, spent six hours in the Memphis airport trying to get here. I am normally animated as heck anyway, so today with three hours of sleep, you just don't know uh, what you might get, so just bear with me. Um, I tend to believe that I am not just the only expert on DMC. I believe that all of you all here present today are just as much of an expert as I am. We all know the data that minorities, kids of color are generally 16, and if you include Hispanics, 30 to 35 percent of the population, yet we're anywhere from 60 to 80 percent of the kids that are confined in locked, secure environments. We all know those things. What I'm going to bring to you today is our results from some surveys that we did in Pennsylvania that are going to be looking at how we would like to treat kids who are involved in the juvenile justice system, and we already know that most of those kids are youth of color. You may be surprised at how the survey results turned out. So my presentation today to you is to give you that and then at the end, we can talk more inclusively about disproportionate minority contact and confinement and, and what we can do or cannot do or what are those issues that in, involve DMC. So with that said, I'm going to get started. This is just to give you a brief idea of models for change that everybody talks about, the John Dean Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. What they are trying to do is just to accelerate progress to more and more fair, race neutral, effective, developmentally appropriate. We talked about functions and how adolescents cannot be expected to function as most adults, mature adults do. Uh, I had a colleague who used to say that kids will just mature out of stupidity at some point. Um, I did. Um, you know, and I think I was more in my 20s than at 18, but sometimes that will happen. I told you I work in Rapides and Jefferson Parish, Louisiana, and I also work in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. And this is a study about the attitudes toward youth and race and crime that I'm going to talk to you briefly about, and we want to go through this quickly. Um, the survey came as a result of a focus group that was done in Allegheny County. So the survey was taken from September 17th through the 29th, and it involved 300 adults. So these are some of the basic survey questions and the results of those survey questions. And this is how it was asked to the participants on the phone in the same manner that you see it written. Do you agree or disagree? Almost all youth who commit crimes are capable of positive growth and have the potential to change for the better. What a novel concept. We always assume that these kids are, what, predators, they need to be locked up, we don't need to do anything with them. The survey results indicate otherwise. 85% agree 
that almost all youth who commit crimes are capable of positive growth, that we can do a better job with these youth. Only 16% disagreed. Next survey question, do you agree or disagree? Incarcerating youth offenders without rehabilitation is the same as giving up on them. Again, the survey results indicate that 77% agree that to do that would be giving up on them and we don't want to do that. Only 22% disagree. Interesting information. Now, if you can tilt your head 90 degrees, um, I'm going to be like a, a typical adolescent and not take responsibility for this slide. Um, this was something that was given to me. And because I have no skills, I was not able to turn all this information around. But anyway, do you factor taking away some of the money the state spends on incarcerating youth and spending it instead on programs? And the answer was yes. Where do those programs need to be spent? The money needs to be spent on helping youth get a high school education. We heard the question about education earlier today and the significance and importance of education. Uh, also, mentoring by adults. This is where maybe your faith-based community can come in. We had a question about that and, and what that can do, or fraternities and sororities. Any ad appropriate adult programs are good. And we also look at vocational training and job skills. If people have a good education, and they feel that they have a skill that they can use to keep them in a good environment that can support them financially, then things are, are good. Now, of course, in this economic status that we're in right now, that's, that's going to be debatable, what's going to happen to us in the next four years. But we're going to think positively. And then we also look at mental health treatment and aftercare services. All those things that the survey results indicate that people are supporting in this process. In your opinion, tell me how effective each of the following is in rehabilitating youth offenders. And again, we can see it mirrors the previous slide. Again, turn, tilt your head 90 degrees. Mentoring, education, the ability for job skills and training all score very high in terms of the survey results. People believe if individuals have the learning that they need and the skills that they need to survive, that they will do quite well in society. Pennsylvania. <clears throat> The public favors community-based facilities and supervision for nonviolent youth offenders. And the responses are clear. 73% yes, 27% no for community-based. Small residential facilities, a much higher number, 81% to 19. Community supervision was something that I found to be interesting because that's when we're talking about probation supervision of some sort. Uh, and the numbers were lower than I would have anticipated them being. Uh, not having been involved in the survey, I really can't tell you exactly why those numbers are that low. I mean, would like to have had a follow-up question as to why. Residential programs, even though they're community-based, seem to be more favorable than supervision in and of itself. And I, that just could be because the community is not quite comfortable with just supervision. They feel the need for some residential placement, even if it's in the community. And the public favors funding more programs to help Hispanic youth who get in trouble with the law, overcome language barriers they face in the juvenile justice system, because we're seeing an influx in the Hispanic Latino population. Uh, and you can see that <clears throat> people agree that indeed 71% um, agree that that is something that we should consider. Only 29% disagree. Public favors reallocating government funds from incarcerating our youth offenders to counseling, education, and job training. This all goes back to the other two slides where you had to tilt your head 90 degrees. And you can see that the public does favor this by 83%. Again, education, job training, counseling, supportive services are all considered to be very important things that youth need in order to survive in this country versus incarceration. And that's a quick look at the survey results 
just to get your, your juices flowing in terms of DMC being looked at in a different way in terms of how do you work with minorities that are involved in the juvenile justice system versus confinement and community service. Thank you. I actually don't need any notes to introduce Beth. Beth and I have been working together um, for 16 years now on, in, on various types of projects. Um, she is uh, a, an expert in the intersection of adolescent development, mental health, and juvenile justice, and has explored that intersection in, in numerous different ways. Uh, some of her work has um, involved looking at mental health symptomatology among kids who are in the juvenile justice system. Uh, some of her work has involved looking at gender differences in terms of what gets kids into the system and how they function when they're there, and that's primarily what she's going to be talking about today. Um, Beth has also, is also one of the leaders in this study of uh, juvenile psychopaths, uh, actually asking whether such a, a character really exists um, or, or not. Um, and uh, she has also uh, been studying, along with uh, several other members of the MacArthur Network, um, uh, the factors that lead serious juvenile offenders to desist from criminal activity. Um, but we've asked her uh, to speak today um, about juvenile offenders. Um, Beth is the, uh, uh, sorry, about female offenders. Beth is the associate professor of psychology um, and social behavior at the University of California. Irvine. So she's come a long way for a, a short talk, and we're, we're very appreciative. Beth? Well, good morning. Um, I guess we are the sleepy panel because it's now 8.30 <laughs> in the morning, and I'm ready to start my day. <laughs> okay. Um, and we certainly can't forget girls. For those of you who work in the system, you know very well that the social landscape of juvenile justice is changing. Um, more and more girls are coming into the system. Now, of course, uh, if you just look at arrests between 1980 and 2003, we know that boys make up the majority of all arrests. Whether you look at self-report or official record, boys are more likely to be in the system uh, than girls. However, this gap is closing. And what's most interesting is if you look at 1981, the gap between boys and girls, and now you look in 2003, that gap is really closing. It used to be about 5% boys, I mean 5% girls, 95% uh, boys. It's now 29% girls. We are seeing a huge shift, so girls are coming, and what this means is we need to have a better system to understand how to treat and take care of girls. The system is male-focused and male-dominated. As such, we know very little about what is the appropriate response and reaction to girls in the system. Now that said, what accounts for this big change? Why is this gap closing? What's so different about girls? And in fact, when you look more closely at the types of crimes that girls are arrested for, if you look at that middle line of the black line called violent crime index, you'll see that it's really in violent crimes where we've seen the biggest change. Girls are becoming more and more violent, or that is, they're being arrested for more and more violent crimes. But when you look more closely at this violent crime index and break out the violent crimes, you'll see that murder and robbery has remained relatively stable. And where the biggest change has actually occurred is in the area of aggregate, aggravated assault. So it's not that necessarily girls may be becoming more and more violent. Some have actually speculated, and there's some research to even suggest, that it's not girls are becoming more masculinized or more like boys. It might just be that our policies and our practices are changing, and we're just widening the net. And in fact, what used to be a simple assault is now turned into an aggravated assault. And so in fact, it's not that girls are becoming more violent, it's that the way we've charged them has made them look more violent. Well, regardless of whether or not they are becoming more violent or not, they're coming into the system and we need to understand what happens to them when they come into the system. That says, looking at just their trends in processing, we know that boys are more likely to be arrested than girls, and in fact, boys are more likely to receive a petition and to be adjudicated more than girls. Where you actually find the biggest interest and difference is in what we call disposition or sentencing, in what happens to girls. Girls actually receive more harsh or more punitive sentences than boys. And the reason for this is unclear. Is it because that they deserve the more harsh or punitive sentences? Or is it because fewer options are available for them and as such they need to be placed in facilities and there aren't very many options and so they get put in more harsh or secure 
uh, placements. This has actually become an area of contention because differential responses by the system, for instance, a girl who's been arrested for a low-level crime, such as shoplifting, is more likely to receive a harsh sentence than a boy who's been arrested for that same crime. Some have argued that we want to protect our girls, and therefore we're going to be more chivalrous, and we need to get that girl services, and as we've heard earlier, getting them services means putting them into the system. At the other end of the spectrum, when a girl commits a very serious crime, like a robbery or a murder, that girl's a very different girl. Girls don't do that. This girl must be really scary. And as such, people actually do a more harsh or severe sentence. So we're looking at these differential responses to girls' behavior, and we actually find the most variation in this area. Finally, looking at their actual institutional behavior. For those who actually are line staff, who work in detention facilities, or actually in different facilities, or juvenile justice facilities with girls, most of the staff don't want to work with girls. Given the choice between working with a girl and a boy, they would much prefer to be on the unit with the boys. Please don't make me work with these girls. These girls are crazy. And as you're going to hear in a minute, there might be some point to that. Uh, but the, the institutional behavior, they're much more volatile, they're much more emotional, they're much more reactive, and they require a lot more attention and response from the system than boys do. Um, and of course, when I first did research on this, I was working with the California Youth Authority, and I came into the California Youth Authority and I said, your girls are really different. They're much more difficult. They're much more demanding. And the California Youth Authority looked at me and said, we didn't need a research study on that. <laughs> and, but, but look at the data. And we, they said, come spend some days on the unit. And so I'd go into the, you know, going into jails, because when I tour the country, I don't really see the sites. I just go to prisons. Um, I go in, and I, I check out the facility. And you know, the boys are like, what's up? How you doing? You know, very low key, kind of walking around walk into the girls' facility, can I do your hair? Come sit over here by me. I, I, well, I mean, just much more of a different volatile emotional response, more interactive. So the institutional behavior is different. We do see a response that's different from girls. And so as a result, practitioners are really challenged with how to respond to those, to those girls and their needs. And as you heard earlier uh, by Tom, this is really in the area of mental health as well, and I wanted to actually highlight some research that we've done. This was a study done as part of our MacArthur Network where we looked at both juvenile offenders as well as community youth. And one of the unique features about our sample is that our community youth were actually selected to model and look comparable to our juvenile offender youth. If you look at the race backgrounds, we actually made sure that our, our, our racial composition was similar because you don't want to compare white middle class suburban youth to juvenile justice youth, as that would not be an appropriate comparison. As you'll notice, our sample was predominantly from lurk, uh, lower and working middle class, and so we actually tried to make sure it was very representative of that juvenile justice sample. So when we were making comparisons in mental health symptomatology, we weren't uh, being confounded by either race or SES. And here's actually what we found. We were using a mental health screen developed by Tom Grisso called the Maisie. This is a mental health screen that looks at a variety of different mental health symptoms. And these symptoms were assessed in both uh, the juvenile population and the community population. And I'm first going to show you the boys here in blue, and about 25 to 30 percent, um, and all the way up to 40 percent for somatic complaints, uh, presented with some sort of mental health symptomatology. Now, these were boys in the community. They had not had any contact with the juvenile justice system. We then looked at girls in the community to see how they compared to the boys. And not surprising, this is what we find in every mental health study, Boys externalize, but girls internalize. You see higher rates of depression. You see higher rates of uh, somatic complaints and suicidal ideation. What you'll notice is, though, that the boys were actually more likely to use alcohol and drugs compared to the girls. This is what you find in the typical community samples. Our sample is no different from any other. Now here comes the big ticket item. How does this compare to kids in the juvenile justice system? And it's no surprise, when you look at boys in the justice system, you see overwhelming rates, particularly if you look at drug and alcohol use, anger, irritability, even depressed, anxious, these internalizing problems, much higher than the community sample of boys. And then, of course, the girls. Anybody working in the system, this is no shock to them. The mental health symptomatology of girls in the system is overwhelming. What I'd like to point out here is that, remember the community sample of boys and girls with alcohol and drug use, the boys were higher. Here there is no statistical difference. The girls are using substances at the same rate as the boys, which is very important to note because now not only are they internalizing more, they're also externalizing. <coughs> given these rates and given this, uh, these situations, 
What we wanted to do was actually look at the magnitude of the gender difference. And what I mean by this is, for instance, if you look just at depressed anxious scale and you look at community girls, you'll see here the girls were obviously higher than the boys in depression and anxiety. What we measure is what's called an effect size, the number, the gap. How big is the gap? The gap is much greater. So not only are the girls more likely to internalize in general, girls in the juvenile justice system ex have, these, have these problems internalized at a much higher rate than the girls in the community. And the same gap, very small here in anger and irritability, but when you get into a juvenile justice facility, the magnitude of the difference is just much greater. Given these things and given these changes, we wanted to then, what can we do to better understand girls and to understand their offending behavior? What is going on with these girls? As such, the best thing to do is often to compare or to see how they are similar to or different from boys. And the first, of course, is at age of onset. Well, when do criminal careers typically start? When, you know, when, when does this typically begin? There's some research to suggest that girls may start their criminal careers earlier. However, the research is not conclusive on this. And in fact, there's some research to suggest they actually start roughly at the same time. Research suggests that about age 15 is when most criminal behavior begins for both boys and girls. The question then, of course, is, well, how long do these careers last? What is the duration of these careers? On average, as you can expect, males tend to have longer criminal careers than females. Females' careers tend to be shorter. But as you're going to hear at the end of my talk, the long-term consequences are typically greater. Finally are the developmental pathways. How do these trajectories look? What does this look like over time? For those of you who have toddlers, I have two young children at home. Uh, Terry Thornberry, Thornberry has been classic in saying those are the most violent years. And in fact, biting and hair pulling is pretty common in my household. Um, and that we actually see during childhood, both boys and girls tend to engage in a lot of the more uh, aggressive and acting out behaviors. Where you actually see the patterns diverge is at adolescence. Girls tend to diminish this behavior. The, you can make very good predictions from childhood behavior for boys to adolescent behavior for girls. It's very difficult, and we actually do a very poor job at making predictions from childhood behavior of girls to adolescent and adult behavior for girls. The predictive ability of, of, our, of our research is just very weak in this area. We don't understand how to make predictions, long-term predictions for girls. And this is where the research is really lacking in how we can best describe the trajectory or pathway for female offending. That said, a lot of the work has tried to identify risk factors. And there's a host of risk factors, huge number of risk factors. And we can fill this entire circle with risk factors. One of the things that I always want to make sure to note is that the risk factors really do overlap. And there's a lot of overlap between boys and girls. And in fact, I'm not going to make, go, go through this entire list, but boys and girls all share these common risk factors from low cortisol levels, low resting heart rate, to poverty, impulsivity, and low IQ. They do also share these following four risk factors. I've highlighted them in yellow because girls tend to have higher rates of these than boys. That is, they tend to have much higher rates of poor parental monitoring. When they have lower levels of empathy, the girls' levels of empathy are much lower. The mental health problems, as you've just seen, tend to be higher and greater. And they tend to be uh, victims of either violence, um, as we talked about earlier, trauma and victimization. And so, as such, these rates are typically higher for girls, but I don't want them to be ignored for boys either. I do want to highlight, however, there are some unique risk factors for boys and for girls. For instance, um, for boys, there have been lower, level, lower levels of the MAOA genotype, as well as um, while males and females uh, both exhibit the flight or fight in a neuroendocrine response, boys are much likely, more likely to engage in the behavior of fight or flight. So they have the same neuroendocrine response, but boys actually engage in the behavior of fight or flight more. Where I want to actually spend most of my focus is on the following two specific female risk factors. And that is a new study um, that's actually come out in EEG brain uh, asymmetries. Uh, boys tend to have more higher activation in their right hemisphere of their brain, and girls tend to have higher activation in the left hemisphere of the brain. However, when you look at antisocial girls, girls who have been delinquent, they tend to exhibit the higher right activation very similar to what boys look like. And so there might be something interesting here in terms of the way in which they process information that we might want to start looking at. 
The area that I want to focus on in particular is in adversarial interpersonal relationships. And in particular, uh, for those of you who work with girls, we know girls uh, tend to be very relational. Uh, their relationships are very important. When they have been threatened or perceived threats, it's very emotionally taken in. You may have heard of the term relational aggression even, where girls gossip about each other, talk about each other behind their backs, and do everything uh, in a very more uh, verbal manner. That said, there's also something called the boyfriend factor. And for those of you who work with girls, we always want to blame the boyfriend. It's that terrible boy who got them into trouble. And as Larry mentioned, we are working on a large-scale study of 14 to 17-year-old serious adolescent offenders. And I just wanted to highlight some of their interpersonal relationships to give you a, a snapshot of what these girls' relationships look like. The age of their first sexual encounter for these, um, these youths, and this, when we say sexual encounter, we mean intercourse. The boys uh, were about 12 and a half years of age. The girls were 13 years and, uh, and a half years of age for their first sexual intercourse. When we actually looked at the number of people they had sexual intercourse with, uh, girls reported approximately five partners, boys 11 partners. That's a lot of partners by 17. <laughs> One of the things that most people comment on about boys and girls is the uh, age that boys and girls typically date their partner. Girls on average, their partners were about two and a half years older than they were. Uh, whereas boys, on average, their partners were about a half a year older than they were. So these girls are not only dating bad boys, but they tend to be older boys. Well, one of the things that we found most interesting in the study, um, and just to give you some, some side notes on this, about 23% or a quarter of our sample were dating boys who were about 20 years of age or older. So these girls were actually dating some pretty, pretty older gentlemen. And um, the thing that I found most interesting is that age difference did not predict delinquency. That is, if you were just because you were dating this older boy, that had no bearing on your offending behavior. What actually was the most powerful predictor wasn't whether you were dating an older boy, but whether or not that older boy actually encouraged you, in what we called antisocial encouragement, encouraged you to engage in delinquent behavior. And we found a really interesting interaction. And what we found here is that if you actually look at, and it's in the pink line, is the high antisocial um, an encouragement. So uh, those are higher scores on offending behavior. And what you find here is that girls who live in homes where their parents, in particular their fathers, this paternal warmth, their fathers are very warm, and the boyfriend is high in antisocial encouragement, you exceed the most offending behavior. Well, wait a minute. Isn't it nice when your father is warm and, and loving and caring? Well, in fact, looking a bit deeper at this, what we think the interpretation might be is that when your boyfriend is encouraging you to be antisocial and your father is expressing warmth, we think these girls might be misinterpreting the warmth as permissiveness. And as such, these two things interact together. And instead of looking at that parental monitoring, that warmth gets it, it translated into permissiveness and in, further just exacerbates the antisocial behavior. So it was a very interesting interaction. And these interpersonal relationships tend to drive some of this antisocial behavior. So this, of course, gets to intervention and treatment. What do we do with these girls? How do we treat them? Well, the first issue that we need to consider is risk assessment. And for those of you who work in the field know you have very few, few gender-specific risk assessment tools that work. And you are not alone in this. Um, as Ed Mulvey's chapter will highlight, there are very few risk assessment tools, if any, that really differentiate the girl population. Also, the treatment programs available for girls. There are very few programs available. There are some gender-specific programming that has been developed that has been found to be effective, but to be honest, very little research has been done on this topic in, in, in relation to girls. Uh, more programming research needs to be done to better identify what programs work. And this really gets into a larger issue of assuming that one treatment program fits all for girls. And this gets into the far, uh, larger uh, implications. We are seeing an increasing number of female offenders in the juvenile justice system. And what we know is that the long-term consequences are more pronounced for females than males. They tend to have higher mortality rates, more psychiatric problems. They have more dysfunctional and violent relationships when they end up getting married. They have lower educational attainment and less stable work histories. Given the rates of mental health problems, what we do see is that the treatment facilities that are available 
uh, tend to be the deep end levels of the system because the system is not equipped to deal, or there are no community mental health services truly available for girls. So they end up going deeper into the system to get treatment, and the risk assessments for prognosis and long-term prediction are very weak to poor. And in fact, in several studies of clinician prediction, research has shown that we're very good to, I shouldn't say very good, we are fair to good at making predictions for males, and we are no better than chance at making predictions for girls. And this leads to my final and most important point that I hope that everybody takes away from this talk today and from the chapter in the, in the Future of Children uh, volume, that female offenders are a heterogeneous group. I think one of the problems in this literature and one of the problems in the field is that girls are often compared to boys. But one of the things that's truly lacking is that no one's pay paying attention to the heterogeneity within the female population. We need to look within gender. Not all female offenders are the same. And so as such, the treatment programs that are put forth are specifically designed for girls without taking into account that not all these girls are, are, are here, here for the same reasons and have the same problems, and so they won't work in the same way. And I think if we are going to have more and more girls in our system, we actually need to look at them as a much more heterogeneous population than we do right now. Thank you. So now we'll <clears throat> turn to our questions from the audience. And again, uh, please use the microphones that are available. Up there on the right. Way up the top. <clears throat> Thank you to both presenters. I enjoyed the uh, presentations. Um, my question is: Have there been any? Has there been any research or studies around pregnant or parenting females in the system, and what have been? What, what are you seeing? The studies that are typically done on pregnant, uh, pregnancy in the system are usually done with adult females. That doesn't mean that, of course, there aren't enough in the juvenile system. I don't feel qualified enough to speak to that, um, but I could certainly try and... Um, Sarah Wakefield at UC Irvine actually does a lot of research with women offenders. Um, and particularly women um, who are parents in the system. We do know that there are problems in terms of contact, in terms of integration with children, in terms of um, just even the way in which they come for visiting hours. So we do know that there's a host of problems, and those problems are even exacerbated in the juvenile system. But I think the most solid research is in the adult system on that, what that I'm familiar with. And I'd be happy to provide you with Sarah's contact information. And I just have one other comment, <clears throat> and that speaks to what you mentioned about girls receiving harsher sentences. If we look at the female adult population that's incarcerated, it mirrors the same thing. So we do need to look at policy in terms of what's happening when it comes to sentencing Absolutely. on females. Great point. Thank you. In the road, right down. Hi, Dr. Coffin. Um, Felipe Franco with New York State Office of Children and Family Services. Um, we have been, begun to look at um, internally at our evidence-based programs like multisystemic therapy, functional family therapy, multidimensional therapeutic foster care. Um, has anyone looked at gender-specific data? Because we actually recently, and you know, we haven't finished up the evaluation with MTFC, but we're finding actually better outcomes with MTFC for girls than we expected. I think that, I mean, there are some programs that have been looked at for gender specific. Um, uh, MFT would be a great, I know Scott Hengler's done a lot of work, but I don't know if he's actually gotten out enough on the gender specificity of that treatment program and how it should be tailored as such to meet the girls' needs, but that would be a great thing to get out in literature. I do know um, uh, Patty Chamberlain's group in Oregon, uh, mm -hmm. they've done some great work on girl specific programming. Uh, uh, okay. So, absolutely, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, oh, it's fantastic. Pass it right ahead, yeah. Yes, please. I just wondered if you have, if your research has included any attention to um, gender specific responses to juvenile justice practices, in particular the difference um, in the use of power, the response to the use of power assertion between boys and girls? When you say power assertion, 
um, using force to overcome bad behavior? Yeah. Um, this was actually something that the California Youth Authority uh, had, had a big problem with because we know two things from early victimization with females. Uh, it can relate to two behaviors. One, into precociousness, so these girls act out sexually inappropriately. Or two, to being touched and not wanting anybody to come near them. And so when a male guard puts their hands on them, it can then exactly. I mean, so uh, one of the things that they have worked on is to always try to have a female staff member uh, on the unit. Um, there were gender discrimination uh, suits that were actually brought forth because uh, then it meant that male staff didn't have the same equal opportunity to get those types of jobs when you required female staff to be present. So in terms of, uh, I think it comes down to training in terms of how that's handled, but I do know that, that a lot of times male staff don't want to be on these units for the very reasons of when an assault or something or having to put their hands on someone, the, the result of that, um, because girls respond uh, volatilely in, in one of two ways, and it can really be explosive. So. Uh, just a brief comment on your survey results, um, Shauna Epps. Um, how do you account for the differences in the survey results you get and uh, uh, policies? The policies and action by politicians are totally inconsistent with that. In fact, most politicians are frightened of making those kinds of statements for fear of being perceived as soft and on crime. And just the other thing, if, if there's time, if um, uh, Dr. Kaufman can comment on the phenomenon of girl gangs and just as importantly, girls joining boy gangs and having cross-gender gangs uh, and how that has affected the rise in aggra aggravated assault. The <clears throat> political sound bites, unfortunately, have tended to control what way juvenile justice performs, unfortunately. You're absolutely right. When you talk about policy, what we encourage jurisdictions to do is to do what the book talks about, which is following the data. How we really need to trace the offenses that these juveniles are getting involved in. We would like for you to try and track the top 10 offenses that you see juveniles come through your system involved in. And when you do that, you're gonna see that these kids are not really violent. They're gonna have a lot of aggression, which is part of depression, we talked about. Uh, so you will see some assaultive situations, but for the most part, these kids are not running out here robbing you, stealing your purse, snatching your purse, that sort of thing. They're doing a lot of things that aren't normal, uh, and when schools get involved, then you get into the zero tolerance, and then you have your school resource officers that get involved, and sometimes they don't have the training to work with youth. I mean, it just mushrooms to the point where when it hits the media, these kids are predators and they need to be locked up. So again, we would like for you in DMC and issues relating to policy to follow the data, to look at that, to track the top 10 offenses as best you can, to look at programs that would attack those issues based on the offense with evidence-based practices such as FFT or MST, getting families involved in the system, to know that your child needs some assistance in a different format or a different way of looking at things. And unfortunately, culturally, minorities when I first started in 1976, seems like 100 years ago, uh, and you had mentioned mental health counseling or counseling of any sort to minorities, they would always say to me, Ms. Etz, I'm not crazy. That is just something that our culture is just very, very sensitive to. Uh, and I would quickly say, no one is in any way saying that you are crazy. It just means that maybe you need to talk to someone other than me or a parent. It's just a, a different format, a different way of looking at things. So a lot of things that are in our culture, when I say in our, speaking as a minority, uh, that we need to work on uh, that says it's okay to make a mistake and you can recover from that mistake. And here are some options and here are some tools that we can give you to do that. 
So yeah, it, it is a fight between politicians and, and the general public. You're absolutely right. Um, before Beth comments, can, I, I, I want to add something to this because um, uh, Alex Pacero and I have been doing some research looking at public opinion uh, surveys of uh, about individuals' um, attitudes toward juvenile offenders. Um, it turns out that that public opinion is a lot more nuanced than, than we think it is. And when you ask questions in the way that the survey that you presented asked them, you find these very favorable responses toward rehabilitation. We, Alex and I have a paper that should be coming out soon that's called Manipulating Public Opinion About Trying Juveniles as Adults. And what we did in this was we systematically varied the content of the question to random samples of individuals. So that some people were asked about the wisdom of trying juveniles as adults when the juvenile in question was a 14-year-old burglar whose offense was a first-time offense, and other people got the exact same question except that the juvenile was um, a, a repeat violent 17-year-old. Um, and you see very, very different responses to the very same question, which is, how do you feel about trying juveniles as adults? And so we can make that number whatever you'd like it to be. I mean, we can make it uh, very, very favorable toward trying juveniles as adults, and we can make it very, very opposed to trying juveniles as adults. I, personally, I'm very skeptical of what these surveys really tell us. What, what we do know, I think, um, and in the book that, that Elizabeth Scott and I um, uh, uh, have, we, we review some of this work, is that the public is very much in favor of rehabilitating younger, first-time, nonviolent offenders. That's very, very clear. When you start talking about 16 and 17 year old violent repeat offenders, the, re the public is not very inclined to try to rehabilitate them. So the notion is that um, we, is that I think for the most part, and, and this makes perfect sense to me, that we're willing to give somebody a second chance. We're not so willing to give that person a third chance, especially if that person seems to be dangerous and seems to be old enough to, to maybe uh, e either know better or, or, or be less likely to change. So I think that when politicians preach those punitive reforms, what they do in order to build support for their positions is they, is they use these cases that get a lot of media attention of violent recidivist older kids. And then when they combine that profile with their call for getting tough on crime, they do see a lot of public support because those are the kids that the public wants to be tough on. The problem is that the public doesn't understand that the vast majority of kids in the juvenile justice system are not violent older recidivists and we shouldn't be making broad juvenile justice policies that, that apply only to that small segment of the population. Uh, to get to your gang question, um, I sort of have three, three responses. One is um, when girls are members of girl-boy gangs, they tend to be more on the periphery and not in the central leadership roles. Uh, two, when there are girl gangs in general, um, they're very, it's a very low base rate. There aren't very, I mean, while it's a sexy topic and it you know, makes great media, they're, they're, they're not as common as, as the media would like to portray. Um, but I think what's important here is, I think this gets to the point of the net widening policies. Um, when you now put a charge on a girl and then you do a gang enhancement, it then, it of course, changes the nature of the, of, the, of the charge. And as such, it makes it an elevated charge. So um, in response to your question, I, I, I sort of see it in, in that way for girls. <coughs> Next question. There, and then this gentleman up here in the third row. Uh, good morning. Uh, this question is for you, Beth. Uh, I wonder what observations or commentary you might make to a defense lawyer who represents a 14-year-old a um, Hispanic young girl uh, who had a, a baby in a, in, a, in a public toilet facility um, and the baby died either as a result of the neglect of having it there or in the attempt to perhaps conceal the, the, the birth and, and generated a, a charge of homicide with possible waiver to adult court. I, I wonder if you have any observations as to what was going on in the psyche of, of, of the young woman that would distinguish her 
from the, gen the general population of a child under those circumstances in, in a different context? I had an answer for that question, I'd be a rich woman. Um, that is a really hard question. Uh, my immediate, immediate reaction is, you know, the girl is 14 years of age, I immediately go um, to the developmental immaturity of the child, long-term consequences. I, use, I would think of those as mitigating factors um, in terms of uh, just girl, you know, not just girls, but adolescents in general are just more developmentally immature and not thinking through what the ramifications of such, such a decision and such a choice would be. Um, in terms of what I would probably also focus on as a defense attorney is making sure she was getting male health services after the fact because I'm sure um, she's probably experiencing some, some issues uh, given the situation. So, but I, I, don't have a, I don't have a brilliant answer on that. And I defer to Bob. <laughs> No, that's fine. <laughs> we, uh, <almost> spoke. <laughs> <laughs> we did. Hi there, Bob. Hi. <laughs> anyway, anyway I, I just thought you might have some comments of general application. No problem. We could leave it there, and I could, you know, I'll talk specifics yeah. later on. That's fine. Thanks very much. Well, I, I, I think that the, from my point of view, um, and I think Beth was, was also saying this, is that the, the fact that she's 14 is more important than the fact that she's a girl or pregnant. Um, and that, you know, I think we see analogous situations where 14-year-olds do things impulsively without thinking about the long-term consequences of their decisions because they're afraid, because they're panicking, whatever. It certainly is unlikely, I think, to be a premeditated uh, 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 act, and in which case I think that um, her, her culpability would be, would be limited in the same way that we would think attribute diminished responsibility to any 14-year-old um, who, who acted in a situation where emotions are, are likely to run high and where there isn't a lot of long-term long -term th thought going on. That's fine. Thank you. Over here. flip side to this. Um, New Jersey, we have safe haven law, and thank goodness for that. But the flip side is a 14-year-old can make a decision to place an infant for adoption in New Jersey. And I wouldn't want that child to be considered irresponsible or in any way judged because of that decision. I, I just think it's a very difficult um, time being 14 years old. And Absolutely, and I, I'm going to let Larry, we, we actually have a paper coming out that, that really deals with the struggle um, between, between these two. Do you want to highlight the paper? Since well, just, just that we, <clears throat> we, we think that, that kids at that age pr probably do have the competence to make a reasoned decision about whether to uh, uh, complete a, term, uh, a pregnancy, keep the baby, or put it up for adoption, or abort the pregnancy. Um, because the way in which those decisions are made are, are typically with the guidance of adults and, and with the advice of either health practitioners or parents or other concerned adults. Um, and <clears throat> the point of the paper that Beth referred to um, is that in, in judging what kids are capable of, we can't necessarily generalize across all kinds of situations. In, in situations where um, they're exposed to a lot of peer pressure or where, where um, uh, the, the, their emotions are very, are very high, they, they may make very foolish and immature choices and we should restrict their, their choices in those situations. But we can construct situations in which 14-year-olds probably can, can reach reasoned decisions, but they need the support and guidance of adults to be able to do that. Okay. If I could make a comment uh, that I think would be of uh, interest to most people around the question that you're debating. 
the American Bar Association does have a position paper, and I brought it with me. It's Adolescence, Brain Development, and Legal Culpability. And if I could just share with you one passage from this, I think that it will summarize what we've been talking about in some positions. And it says, the evidence now is strong that the brain does not cease to mature until the early 20s, referring to age, in those relevant parts that govern impulsivity, judgment, planning for the future, foresight of consequences, and other characteristics that make people morally culpable. Indeed, age 21 or 22 would be closer to the biological age of maturity. So that becomes the standard for culpability. I wanted to uh, get back to uh, the uh, question of disproportionate uh, representation. Um, the United, the United States is, or maybe today I should say was, given the recent changes in our uh, culture, a unique culture in some regards with unique and peculiar institutions and histories. And uh, I know that uh, it was indicated that we all know those unique institutions and histories, but I'm wondering if, and, and I know that there must be research that has been done that um, compares our experience here in the United States with somewhat similar cultures because the world has become a much different place than it was in the 70s and 80s and even the 90s with migration and immigration. Um, Britain, for instance, is probably, um, uh, well, I shouldn't say probably, in some ways might be a little bit more ref reflective of some aspects of American culture and even historic history in terms of uh, uh, racial, ethnic, economic issues. So I'm wondering if, and this would apply also for, for, uh, for women or girls in, involved in the ju juvenile justice system, what does the research show today in terms of uh, the similarities or differences of experience in somewhat similar cultures? Unfortunately, I have no knowledge of direct research that would indicate some similarities. I can tell you that for first-generation immigration youth and families, there is little to no delinquency. But as those families continue to stay in this country, you will see some sort of increase in delinquency. But I really don't know of any comparison, um, so I'd have to defer to others here who may, but I just don't. Okay, thank you. I guess we need to, could do some research in that. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. I think with the example that the gentleman was brought up about the Hispanic young lady, 14 years old, we've all been talking about the situation but taking it outside of a cultural context. I mean, there is a cultural context here. He mentioned that she was Hispanic. I don't know which country her people come from, but the cultural context of certain Latinos is that a young girl of that age having a baby brings enormous amounts of shame upon the family. It depends on the country that you're talking about, obviously. So without knowing more, I don't think you could really get into it, but I think that a lot of what we're talking about, we need to put it also in a cultural context 
When we're talking about quote unquote violent youth, some of them are violent in response to the violent atmosphere that they live in. They have to carry weapons to protect themselves. We need to put things in a cultural and sociological context before we're going analyzing these types of issues. Other questions? Well, thank you very much, and um, thanks to our panelists for the questions.